Here's another example. We're going to integrate 1 over 1 plus x squared. That function has no vertical asymptotes for real values of x. I could certainly integrate it from 0 to infinity, for example, and see if it converges. Or 7 to infinity, for that matter. Or maybe negative 14 to infinity, for that matter. I also could integrate it, or try integrating it, from minus infinity to infinity. Now, there's a temptation here to write this as a limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from negative b to b. And that does get you the right answer for problems where the improper integral does converge, where it behaves in a robust way. However, that approach can be misleading, it turns out, for some other kinds of examples. So instead, what we do is we say this improper integral converges if and only if two other improper integrals converge. This one and this one. Using the zero there is actually kind of arbitrary. As long as I'm consistent, I could use the same number in either spot. I could use a seven in both spots. I could use a negative 33 in both spots and positive pi squared in both spots. It doesn't matter. We define, define this to converge effectively if and only if both of these converge by these i mean these other integrals and we say it converges to their sum as well like i've already written with the equal sign and the plus sign and it converges to their sum in that case And again, I could use some other number other than zero to truly make this really robust. I'd want that, I'd want to get the same answer no matter what number I used here. So this is not a true definition because of that, but it's, it's good enough for us. So this means I need to think about both of these integrals. Now, by symmetry, these integrals are actually going to be the same value if, and if they both can, if one converges, the other will converge and will converge to the same thing because of the symmetry. The graph of y equals one over one plus x squared looks like a bell shaped curve centered on the y axis. The area to the right, if it exists as a finite number, will be the same as the area to the left of the y axis. Is this the bell-shaped curve from statistics? Looks like it, but it's actually not. It's got a different formula. I'll just think about this one and hint at how to think about this one. But to fully justify this, you really do need to think about both and show they both converge. If, if, if even one of them diverges, then the, the entire improper integral over here diverges, if even one of these diverges. But again, because of symmetry, if one of these converges, so will the other one. Let's think about the first one here. Remember, by definition, that's the limit as b goes to infinity of proper integrals from zero to b. And I do want you to continue writing limit signs. I said, after this class, your teacher may say, you don't need to bother with the limit signs. Maybe even me, in fact, I, I'm teaching a more advanced stats class right now called Applied Stats, where just yesterday we were doing improper integrals. And I said, don't worry about writing the limit sign to those people. 
but I'm saying to you, because you're first learning this, I do want you to write the one that's next. That's a memorized integral. It's the inverse tangent function. You can also write arctangent. I remind you once again, calculators use inverse tangent. Mathematica uses arctangent. I'm using the fundamental theorem of calculus here. Inverse tangent of zero is zero. You can double check that on your calculator. So this simplifies to the limit as b goes to infinity of the inverse tangent function. Does anybody happen to know if that limit exists just off the top of your head? And if you do think it exists, you know what it equals. Does anybody happen to know? I'm interested in knowing if any of you know. No, cal no calculators allowed. <laughs> Okay, you can, you can, okay, fine. Go ahead and use your calculator and see if you can guess the answer. While you're trying to guess, I'm going to draw a picture over here. First of all, I'm going to graph the tangent function. You may remember from, you know, pre calculus or something that you took a year or two ago, that the graph of the tangent function is periodic and looks about like this. It's got vertical asymptotes. Does anybody want to guess the answer? The answer is pi over two. That is correct. And this limit exists and does equal pi over two, meaning this integral exists, it converges and does equal pi over two. But why? Well, you gotta know some things. You gotta know what the graph of the tangent function looks like. By the way, knowledge is important. It's certainly not the reason that we live. Uh, not to puff ourselves up with knowledge, but because it's helpful for doing problem solving, for example, knowing how to use technology, having some knowledge that helps you understand things. You, you're not bogged down in trying to even understand what, what fact we're using. You're freed up to do more advanced problem solving if you know some things. In this case, the tangent function looks like this. This is a very, a very, very not one-to-one -one function fails the horizontal line test miserably. Any horizontal line goes through it infinitely many times because the graph goes on forever with this pattern. However, if we consider any one of these pieces like this piece, just that piece and ignore everything else, and in fact, restricting the domain, that one piece is one-to-one. -one. No horizontal line goes through that piece more than once. What's the domain of this piece? It goes from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. Is that a coincidence? No, it's not. Pi over two radians, by the way, is an angle measure corresponds to 90 degrees. It's not a coincidence because remember also that the inverse function of an invertible function Graphically, if it's got the same independent variable x, is the reflection of the graph of the original function across that line, which is kind of tricky to draw, but is helped if you turn your paper so that the y equals x line is straight up and down. Then it's a little easier to draw. The symmetry makes it look about like this. And if the original graph has vertical asymptotes at plus or minus pi over two, then the new red graph is going to have horizontal asymptotes at plus or minus pi over two. That is y equals inverse tangent of x. It's cut, got two distinct horizontal asymptotes. That can happen. That's an example. 
of a function with two distinct horizontal asymptotes. And yeah, as the input goes to plus infinity, the function approaches the horizontal asymptote up there, which is at pi over two. The one down here is at negative pi over two. That's a graphical reason why the answer is pi over two. But you got to know some things. You got to know which piece, the, what the graph of the tangent function looks like, what's its domain of the piece that we invert for the inverse tangent function. Likewise, the other integral also equals pi over two. I'm not going to do it, but if you were going to do it, you'd have to write it as a limit as the bottom limit goes to minus infinity. Maybe you'd write limit as a goes to minus infinity of the integral from a to zero. And what you would end up getting in the end is the limit as a goes to minus infinity. You'd actually get a negative inverse tangent of a because with the fundamental theorem of calculus, you would be um, subtracting what you get when you plug in a because it's the bottom limit of integration. And this is going to be negative of negative pi over two. And that's positive pi over two. So you still get pi over two as well. And that makes sense by symmetry of the graph. Right there. And that does mean this integral converges. And it converges to pi over two plus pi over two, which is pi. Weird, pi, what? Where are the circles? Wouldn't there have to be circles somewhere if pi is involved? It's a mathematical mystery. This is what makes mathematicians excited about doing math is pi shows up in all these strange places. I was gonna say that using circle kind of drives curiosity. Yeah, the unit circle, I guess I was thinking about it sort of well in the background, at least with the tangent and inverse tangent. But that it's a mystery then why, why is the inverse tangent involved? Why well, that's related to derivatives. It's still kind of mysterious that pi should become involved. We're actually going to see lots of other places in chapter nine where pi becomes mysteriously involved in, in, in spots. The most famous of which is the most beautiful equation in the universe. E to the i pi power plus one equals zero. What? What in the world is that? That is the most beautiful equation in the universe. Why? Because it's got the five most important numbers in it, we're all in one simple equation with this with the simplest operations, addition, multiplication, and exponentiation. Um, okay, we don't, we, we'll talk about why that works later, not now. 